at the time it was the most colossal empire on earth since ancient Rome. It had the foremost navy on the planet. And it was engaged in the greatest amphibious assault in a hundred years. I'm talking about the British Navy 245 years ago this week. Starting in early July, um, back into June, starting in early June and on into July, into August, the 25,000 inhabitants, the full population of New York City at the tip of Manhattan Island Peninsula, watched as one, then many, ships of the British Navy sailed from Halifax after they had been ousted from the siege of Boston at the beginning of 1776 and sailed up to Halifax to recoup and uh, regain strength. Um, and starting in June, they began to sail into New York Harbor. Within days, the inhabitants of Manhattan and the Continental Army that was stationed there with zero ships watched as more than 300 British naval gunships sailed into New York Harbor. One of the Continental Army said, I couldn't believe my eyes. It was as if all of London was afloat. And the masts of the ships made a forest in the harbor. It was on Tuesday, July 2nd, <clears throat> that uh, British Admiral Howe began his amphibious assault and began to land his troops on Stanton Island. And it was that same day, it was overcast that day in New York City, Tuesday. It was that same day south in Philadelphia, it was a bit more sunny there, that the Continental Congress uh, adopted the resolution for, uh, for independence unanimously out of the 13 colonies with only, ironically, only New York abstaining from the vote. Two days later on Thursday in Philadelphia, <clears throat> they endorsed the edited copy of the Declaration of Independence and Monday, July 8th, George Washington had a copy that his friend John Hancock sent him, full copy of the text, and he read it to a large portion of the troops stationed in New York City on the commons of King's College on Monday. An incredible, incredible moment, week, <clears throat> and event um, that lasted almost seven years. It's interesting to know that George Washington and his army lost a majority of the battles during the Revolutionary War. They lost more battles than they won. But it would be six, six and a half years later <clears throat> that delegates from the 13 colonies, the United States of America then in Paris, signed the Treaty of Paris in 1783, ending <clears throat> the Revolutionary War and establishing forever the independence of our great nation. This picture from Dominic de Andrea is, this painting rather, is um, a painting of the Battle of Long Island or the Battle of Brooklyn um, that was the first major battle there in that part of the campaign after the siege of Boston, preceded by that, of course, by Lexington and Concord, the shot heard around the world. Um, this happened in actually August of 1776, and it was a great, great loss. They retreated, retreated to Manhattan, retreated to White Plains and Westchester, and then retreated to New Jersey and kept retreating until they found opportunities to um, skirmish against, again, the largest empire on the earth at the time. And eventually began to win and won. And uh, that's what we remember in our national history. I, I, I'm trying to think about that day when they're signing, <clears throat> um, endorsing rather, uh, the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia that day in New York. They didn't sign it for a month. They actually signed it in August, August 2nd. But um, what was happening in New York, surrounded Surrounded. I'm, I think a lot about that, and I've been thinking about it, especially this week, reading a lot about it. I feel very, very similar sometimes as a Christian churchman 
in 2021, I feel a bit surrounded by attacks of the enemy, by um, th this enemy may not, may not have a face or a name. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the spiritual battles and cultural um, war that we seem to be in, right? And I'm thinking about how difficult it is, how we often feel a bit outnumbered. We feel a bit surrounded. It's almost like we have zero ships and we're looking at hundreds of ships of the most powerful navy in the world at the time. I, I, I think about four things and we're going to see one of those in our text today in our study about four things that I think are absolutely critical for this whole endeavor if we are truly surrounded in a battle like this that one was a losing battle I think absolute devotion to God the dependence on God an obligation to the truth a duty to the family of the church and a commission to the world we have to hold on to those things we can't lose a single one and that third, a duty to the family of God in the church is what Paul really speaks directly towards in a very unique text today. And I can't wait to open it up with you. So if you've got your Bibles, we'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That's the text and the book that we are in in our series, Future Glory, Present Trial. Um, every word of 1 Thessalonians here, and we're down to the last few verses of the letter. Finish that over the next few weeks. Um, take a break, and we'll start some beautiful things at the beginning of the school year, which is rapidly approaching. And then we'll do every text of 2 Thessalonians, which is actually shorter but much denser um, and uh, a little bit more exciting, uh, you'll see. But uh, as we walk through this text, we've been really, really challenged. And I wanna give you a quick recap as you turn to chapter five, starting in verse 14. Um, we saw three chapters of introduction. This is one of Paul's earliest letters written about the year AD 50 um, to a young church that he had planted, stayed there perhaps a couple of months, was run out in the middle of the night. You recall, I've told you this a lot. Um, they ran down the street, down to planted some other churches, and then um, the, the angry mob chased them to that city. And then they originally sent Paul, or eventually sent Paul on a ship down to Athens and into Corinth. From where Corinth, he wrote this letter. Uh, it's a one of the earliest letters of Paul. Second perhaps only to the letter to the Galatian churches. So we see early Paul, we see the pastor uh, Paul, we see his heart for the church and his heart for the Lord. And a lot of his language in this letter seems to be the seed thoughts of a lot of the language that he writes in future letters. It's really powerful. So we get three chapters of introduction, effusing with love and admiration and, and this spiritual pride that he has for this church. We're so proud of you. And then in chapter four, he finally turns to the body of the letter. He begins to talk about sanctification, which we have said, that's a big Bible word, but it's important to define big words accurately. We have defined sanctification as the lifelong process of embodied holiness. I always think the shorter the definition, if it's accurate, the better. Um, so sanctification is the lifelong process of embodied holiness. It means to actually become holy as Jesus is holy, as God is holy. Um, and that's the first thing. Then he talks about how sexual immorality fits into that. Then he talks about love. And then he talks specifically about some things that the church was struggling with, particularly the death of believers. And I want to clarify chapter 4, verses 15 through 18 that we talked about many weeks ago about how um, the dead in Christ will raise and will we who are alive at Jesus' coming will not precede those who have died. I want to make it clear to you that Paul, in all of his texts, says that when a believer dies right now, they are with the Lord in spirit. To a Hebrew, uh, of course, Paul was ripe in Hebrew tradition. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, probably an up-and-coming member of the Sanhedrin. He had memorized the Old Testament in Hebrew. So for a Hebrew, death means a separation. 
um, particularly separation of spirit and body. And so when the body goes into the ground, um, the spirit immediately for believers is with the Lord. Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when we say when the death of our loved ones or friends who are have trusted in Jesus, they are with the Lord. That is absolutely true. Um, Paul talks about their bodies in the ground will rejoin them in this resurrection body and they'll do it before we do when we meet Jesus in the air. Just to be clear, that beautiful, beautiful truth um, is clearly seen in all of the texts that we see. And then he talks about um, the times and epochs. And if you were here, we laid out a huge timeline of all of history on the stage and had some fun with that. We'll bring that back out again in coming weeks, especially in Second Thessalonians, because it's going to get more intense and a little bit more colorful there. Um, and then last time we were in our text, we talked about um, Paul's shift to church leadership and how he is asking the church to appreciate um, and to love and support the leaders of the church. And then right from that, we get these few verses. Now, these are unique, and you can tell. They're the shortest verses in the Bible, a couple of them. You, everybody, uh, or you probably know that, yeah, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept, shortest verse in the Bible. Well, it's got a cousin. There's a two-word verse in this passage. There's a three-word verse in this passage. Um, it's staccato if you're a musical person. It's rich, and every single verb in these verses is a command, an imperative. There are nine of them. Paul is laying it out. It's almost like he feels the end of the parchment coming, and he says, man, I got to get it all in. And so he says these things starting in verse 14. We urge you, brethren, Admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's it. That's our text for today. Let's read it one more time. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I want to establish first who Paul is talking to, who he's talking about, and who he's speaking for. We can clearly see that with the beginning of this passage and the end. So look at the first part. Of verse 14, we urge you, brethren. Um, this is not just talking to men. This is a perfect translation of the Greek, but he's not just talking to the men of the church. Of course, in a patriarchal society, he would have written that. It's perfectly understood that he's talking to the men and women of the church in Thessalonica. He's talking to the church. Whenever you see the word brethren, it is the men and women and children, believers in the church. So we urge you, brethren. So we'll hold that. Exhibit A, what about exhibit B, the last part of the text? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let me ask you, who is in Christ Jesus except believers? So he's speaking to the church. He says it at the beginning and he says it at the end. I'm speaking to you, church, not just the leaders of the church. I'm speaking to you, the family of the church, the father's family. I'm speaking to you and I've got some things to say. So the nine commands that he says in between those are all relevant and applicable for the church. I say that because they're going to get a little difficult. It starts off difficult. Let's look at the first command. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. This is written for the church, within the church, to the church. Uh, <clears throat> it's a little bit uncomfortable to talk about the unruly in the church, but there are unruly in the church. There was then, there are now, there's been everywhere in between. That word unruly can mean undisciplined. It can mean insubordinate. It means someone who's supposed to be following a leader but steps out of line and goes his own way. It's the only time that that word is used in the New Testament, but we get that larger definition from the Greek literature that use it not rarely. 
Admonish doesn't mean to teach. It's often paired with the word teaching. It's used eight times in the New Testament. But admonish means to correct, to warn, to urge um, someone with a sense, a significant sense of, uh, of, of authority, even uh, urgency. So it's to correct the insubordinate, to warn the undisciplined, to admonish the unruly, and that can make us uncomfortable. It should make us uncomfortable with one question, but we often skip over that question. I'm chief among the sinners, and that question is this. Am I unruly? (laughs) Am I undisciplined? Have I stepped out of line and decided to go my own way. He says that it's important, it's critical for the church to understand their role. And he's writing to all of you. He's not writing to the leaders, he's writing to all of us. He says it's all of our job to admonish the unruly. Now you may be thinking of church discipline and you would be thinking right, but most people when it comes to the idea of church discipline put church discipline up here and they think you may, I'm assuming, you think of maybe one category and that's the official, you know, elders are coming, uh, we need to have a conversation and we are in a room and we have this conversation, it's probably awkward. Um, That is church discipline and we exercise church discipline on at least three levels, doctrine, um, that's the main church discipline that we see in the scriptures, division, divisive acts and destructive behavior, that's the kinds of conversations that we have and we have those with the hope and goal of restoration and reconciliation which is always what church discipline is we have those as often as we need to but the most church discipline the most and the most prevalent and the most beneficial kind of church discipline happens like this hey man I noticed in small group over the last couple weeks that um you seem to be struggling in your marriage and I didn't really like the way I just saw it. Maybe I'm the only one. I didn't like the way that you spoke to your wife. You kind of snapped at her. Can we, uh, can we maybe grab a coffee and just talk about that? I'm worried about you. You see, that's, that's church discipline and it's the most beautiful kind because it comes within relationship. It comes in a safe space and it is admonishing the unruly. Hey, um, I noticed in the last month when we pray together when we talk about the scriptures when we meet in small group when we do this thing that you haven't said a word are are you doing okay hey how how often are you sitting with Jesus in his word are are you doing that or is there is there something that I can help you with see you're not crushing them you're just asking hey how are things going and then the person will say you know man I'm I'm really struggling, especially during the summer. For some reason, I said this to some friends recently, for some reason, when I'm out of my rhythm, I'm a a creature of habit. I like waking up at this hour and doing this and then doing that. And like the very first thing, I get my cup of coffee and I sit with Jesus for an unhurried amount of time. But when I'm out of town or when I'm traveling or whatever, that all gets disrupted and sometimes it leads to inconsistency. And yeah, thank you for noticing, wow. I'd love for you to pray with me that that gets back into the beautiful rhythm that I want to enjoy. That's church discipline. That's admonishing the unruly. And it's all of our responsibility. Admonish the unruly. Second, he says, encourage the faint-hearted. Unfortunately, the word faint-hearted is also only used one time in the New Testament right there. But... In Greek literature and in the translation of the Greek Old Testament, we see a couple of uses of it, and it's a perfectly um, good translation, faint-hearted, those who are feeble in spirit, those who are um, overcome with discouragement. Uh, It says encourage. That word is not the typical word for encourage. It's a side word that's only used a couple of times, but it means to come alongside, um, to comfort, to console. It's used of what the Jews did for Mary and Martha at the death of Lazarus. They came to console her, to comfort her, to encourage. That word encourage is often linked to death and tragic events when it's used. To encourage the faint-hearted. And you know that there are many in our church, especially after last year. I'm just proud that we all made it through and we're still making it through. 
it's important for you to understand that most of us have this cultural persona that we've got to come and put on a good face. And when people ask how we are, we say fine, which never means fine, by the way. That's a first clue, red flag, okay? How are you doing? Fine. That means not fine, by the way. So just know that, okay? That means I'm not fine. I'm freaked out. I'm insecure. I'm neurotic. I'm all kinds of things, okay? Um, and we have to know, man, uh, <clears throat> Are you discouraged? Are you, are you struggling? I, I want to encourage you. I want to come alongside. I want to, I want to console and comfort you because it's my responsibility. It's my duty in the family of God. That's what Paul would say. Admonish the unruly. Come and warn and correct the insubordinate. Then encourage, console the discouraged. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Now, you think that sounds simple, help the weak, but weak is a really beautiful word. All of this, by the way, all of these word studies I have done for you in the sermon notes on our app and website, so you can have all the information for you there. Weak is used quite a bit, but it has the multiple layers of idea. It can mean uh, sick. It can mean um, the suffering of illness. It can mean just physically frail, weak, um, like I've been most of my life, especially in junior high, right? I mean, just like skinny. You look, wow, okay, that guy needs a cheeseburger, okay? Um, it can also mean morally weak or even weak in the faith. And I think Paul has the mind of those last couple of things without dismissing any of the meaning. He says, it is your responsibility, church. It is your duty to come along those who are weak, either sick and suffering, frail, morally weak, or struggling in their faith, and to help them. It is your responsibility. It's three things, admonish the unruly, Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and then there's this catch-all, fourth one, be patient with all, with everyone, and that is, in case you don't know how to do this, be patient. Have a long, long fuse. That is to resolve, to commit to the relationship and see it out. Don't give up and give in when things get rough because things will always get rough and relational conflict always lasts longer than we want it to in the church family, in our marriage, in our friendships. And this is all about the breakdown of something. He says over it all and in it all, be sure and be patient. Be patient with one another. But admonish the unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. Then we get two more. That's all in one verse. We go to verse 15. See that no one repays another evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. We got two more commands in here. See to it and seek all of these commands, all imperatives. We have admonish, encourage, help, be patient. That's four. Now we have two more. See to it and seek. All commands, very clear in the text. In fact, there are no other verbs except the verbal form of the word repays in the text. There are only 10 verbs and repays has a specific form. It says, oh, it's not a main verb. So when you read it in Greek, these nine words come out of the text. Number five and six, see to it that no one repays evil for evil. And here's the difficulty when we come to relational conflict or any kind of conflict, especially in our family or in the family of God. Most of us have this ingrained desire for justice. And we want justice, especially when someone hurts us, when we feel like they've wronged us, and we seek that justice in some dysfunctional ways quite often. I know I do. I learned it growing up, man. I learned it by watching my parents, my family, my relationship with my brother. I was well-equipped with dysfunctional conflict resolution strategies, and I employed them regularly, right? I remember one day I was sitting um, on my couch in my living room. I love my parents. They're good people. They're probably watching right now. I love you, mom and dad. Um, 
they, they have had conflict and they, they work through their conflict just like any married couple does, right? And uh, we've talked about that. They've talked to it. We've, we've got a great relationship. But I was sitting on the couch with my wife saying, man, I wish they would do that differently. And they were, they were visiting over and they were having this little conflict. And she leans over, my godly, beautiful wife. And she says, you do exactly the same thing. I was like, no, I don't. He goes, yeah, you do. I was like, what? Uh, we got to talk about that. Okay. And so we just learn these things. It's almost as if it's natural. It's easy to pick up bad habits. Have you noticed that? It takes work to be holy and disciplined, but it's easy to be dysfunctional and undisciplined. It's easy. You wake up and it just starts to happen. So Paul says here, it's the duty and responsibility of the church that you see to it that no one repays evil for evil to one another. That when someone hurts, when we strike back, it creates an endless cycle of retribution and vengeance. Where does it end? When do we remember that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord? I'm the only one who knows the heart of man fully. You need to trust that to me. Here's the difficult part about not repaying evil for evil is it requires a truckload of faith, a truckload of trust in God, and a truckload of understanding that his grace in my life means that I don't experience justice. I don't pay for my own sin. And so his grace in others' lives means that I might not experience justice in this relationship either, but that Jesus died for that too. Jesus died for the wounds, and there are many, that I've inflicted upon others, and Jesus has also died for the wounds that others have inflicted upon me. And he says, you need to remember that and give it your great attention, church. See to it that no one repays evil for evil for one another. It's our, all of our responsibility. And the second one in this is seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Seek after that which is good. And I got to tell you, of all of these things, and all of them are difficult, I know there's nine of them, so I'll boil it. I mean, we're not even finished with the list of commands. There's only nine. There are nine. I'll boil it down to you. Just, just choose nine of them and focus on that, okay? You can't, you can't pick more, less than that. So he gets to this seek after that which is good. I, I tell you, that, that can become at least in my experience, one of the hardest ones because it's a constant contending for the good and the benefit and the blessing of the relationship and the family of God. It's constant. It's assuming the best. It's thinking the best. It's activating my faith when it comes to difficult conflict and difficult relationships, disappointment, unmet expectations, all of the above. I gotta constantly remember, and it's all of our responsibility, I must contend and constantly with resolve and endurance and perseverance seek after that which is good, which will always be around truth and grace and Jesus and the spirit and the gospel. And then we get these last four. Shortest verse in the Bible with Jesus wept. Rejoice always. You know, that's a good centering practice. It reminds our heart and our mind whose we are, where we are, what we're supposed to be about. Rejoice. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't turn down a greater amount of joy in my life. You know what the scriptures say? That the fuel for joy is ample, it's everywhere. We just have to have eyes to see and a heart to receive it. It's in the heavens. It's in the nature of God. It's in the promises of God. It's in the people of God. It's in the creation of God. It's in the word of God. It's in the church of God. It's everywhere. The fuel for joy is everywhere. So that means if we don't have high levels of rejoicing, that we're not tapping into the fuel that is everywhere. 
We're we're either resisting to see it or failing to see it. It's simply everywhere. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. You're like, all right, Scott, bring it on. Make me feel bad about how little I pray. I got it. I'm there with you. It's hard. I understand. Especially when you see it as a duty, when you see it as some uh, chore that you have to do. But when you understand that prayer is the language of dependence and prayer is the language of family and intimacy, God repeatedly says, and this is part of the revolution that Jesus the Son incarnate brings and brought. When he started calling God Father and then he gave us permission to call him Father. It was revolutionary. That's why the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees got really upset, part of the reason. You can't call God Father. There's nobody that has a relationship. He says, no, that's true. I have that relationship. He is my eternal Father. I'm his eternal Son. And you, by faith, can have that kind of relationship. So when you pray, you can pray to Father. Revolutionary. When you understand that prayer is the language of intimacy, not a chore that can make things different. And finally, give thanks in everything. Gratitude, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Here's my big idea. We wanna celebrate the Lord's Supper here in just a second. Within the Father's family, there are critical practices that provide maximum joy. I think Paul gives us nine of them here. Is there a way we could organize the nine? This is a little artificial, I admit to you, but I'm trying, okay? Nine is difficult for me to remember. I think I've memorized this passage. It's easy for you to memorize if you put your mind to it. But I want to help understand these nine commands in maybe a more illustrative way. So here's my best shot. I want to say that there are four, two, and three, okay? Four, two, and three of the commands. We'll break them up. First four, I want to call discerning commands. Because I think here's the point. Paul says, consider the person in front of you. And here's the question. Are they one of everyone? Yes. Okay, be patient. (laughs) Are they one of all? Everyone? Yes. Okay, now, bottom rule, be patient. Then you have to discern what their need is. Are they undisciplined and unruly? Are they just discouraged and faint-hearted? Are they weak? See, that discerning moment will guide how you are supposed to engage that individual. And that's the responsibility of the whole church. See, within the family of the Father, there are specific practices that help us ensure and provide and enjoy maximum joy in his family, this side of heaven. There won't be any unruly, faint-hearted, or weak in heaven. You know that? This is only for here. So this is a discerning command. So you, friend, when you next engage an issue, probably as soon as you leave this room or in the drive on the way home or when you pick up your kids from the nursery, right? Maybe if you're lucky, it's tomorrow lunch or whatever, I don't know. Are they faint-hearted? Are they weak? Are they unruly? Are they part of everyone? The answer to the last one is always yes. Okay, be patient and then discern. The next two, I say four, two, and three. The next two, I wanna call protecting commands because this is looking out. Hey, see to it. No one repays evil for evil. This is a, a, a job description to protect. See to it, no one. And seek with endurance and perseverance the good and contend for it. And then I also already gave the word away, but the last three I want to call centering commands. These remind us very, very powerfully of the central role of Father, Son, and Spirit in our life and how we can never fully engage all of these practices in the family of God unless we are fully walking in the Spirit of God and not in the flesh. And how do we contend to walk in the Spirit? Well, we rejoice We pray, we give thanks. These are all worshipful practices, by the way. 
Give thanks is a verb that is so attached to worship of deity that in Greek literature outside of the Bible, at times it becomes equivalent to prayer. Give thanks in Greek literature can mean to pray. It's so related and linked to worship. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let me put them all up on the screen for you. And we'll look at it. Admonish the unruly instead of avoid, because that's typically what we like to do, right? Hey, undisciplined, insubordinate people. Okay, uh, we're just going to, you stay over there. I'm going to come over here, okay? But no, your responsibility is to admonish them instead of avoid. Encourage the faint heart instead of overly burden them. You see, oftentimes when we meet discouraged people, we pile on duty on top of them, and they just become more faint hearted. Don't overburden them. Help the weak instead of judge them. You really struggling with your faith? Dang. Shouldn't have said that out loud. All right. Well. Help the weak instead of judge. Be patient with everyone without anger. See that no one repays evil, but rather bless them. Right? Seek after the good and contend for it. Finally, rejoice always instead of being resentful. Joy is a great, great antidote and a cure for resentment. Focusing on the blessings of God. Pray without ceasing instead of grumbling. Present your request to the Father who invites you in. Give thanks in everything and acknowledge God the fuel for gratitude and prayer and joy are all around Within the Father's family, there are critical practices that provide maximum joy, and it is the responsibility of all of us. Why? Because we are one body. We have a responsibility for each other. This is what God has called us to, 